So sure about what, Dad? About Carson. He doesn't stack up. To what? As a suspect. Don't put avocado on the burger. What? Simple is always best. Look, Carson killed Jordan and Atlanta. Then those two degenerates at Crazy Betty's Motel. Hell, he even tried to kill you, didn't he? Have you forgotten that? But Carson was a coke dealer. Why would he want to kill his clients? And what would be his motive for killing Alana and Jordan and the Moorwood girl? It doesn't make sense, sir. I'm sorry. There you go again. Now you're piling hummus on top of the burger, too. What if he was punishing them? He knew Alana was cheating on her husband. He knew that Frank and Goldie were making porn. And who would know all that? Someone they knew. Someone they trusted. You mean like a drug dealer? Sir, a drug dealer with morals? Come on. All right, I read Brenda's magazine. Christmas, the number one holiday for people going nuts. That's motive enough for me. This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Welcome back to another instalment of Silent Night in PCs. This is a subseries of the podcast under stairs where we take the remake Silent Night from 2012. We break up into five minute reviewable chunks. I get podcasters from around the globe to sit down and review it with me. And then the release order is completely fucked up because why do anything simple when you can do it complicated? That's my motto. It's going to my gravestone. Joining me in this episode to discuss minutes 80 through 85, so tantalisingly close to the end of this movie. This is all business now. Shit has ramped up. I need the real deal here with me. I need the big guns. Is Mr. Liam Rafferty. How's it going, Liam? I am very well. Thank you. How are you? I am I am well. I am looking forward to chatting about this dialogue light. Not a lot of dialogue here. But there is some straight up WWE style wrestling punches thrown here, and I kind of love that. That's yeah, all and in the about colors. Is. The colors. Oh, oh it's, it's like bathed in neon. Um, oh. It's like it's, it's unreal. Like for some reason, when when the power goes out in this police station, <laughs> Argento comes in and does the lighting. It's the lighting by Argento, <laughs> um, and the lighting doesn't make sense. Every other room where you would conceivably need light is bathed in red <laughs> and in the room where the danger actually is like the cells is bathed in green green is a safe color red is a sinister color i kind of feel like they changed the pulps i don't care <laughs> <laughs> it's also not safe if, if that is how you had to find the fire exit that is Awful. Yeah, see, awful the power safety. went out in the. Oh, that, look, this may, as someone that doesn't understand these things, if the power went out in your building, you had a generator to generate light. Why would you just not generate normal light? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Rather than someone might be able to green. explain this to me. I don't see the purpose of making the room like so dark with a, a, a red hue. Like, I, I like it. <laughs> it seems so fucking silly. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. But that's where we're going to start here. This opens with uh, Brenda, the receptionist, uh, hiding from Santa in a room which I've described on another episode as a uh, what is this room? It is basically a box room. It's not a storage cupboard because there's no shelves, no no nothing in it. It is just a room. Mm-hmm. It looks like a kind of like a toilet without a toilet or a sink or anything. It's not, but she locks us. But it's, it's important enough. This room is important enough that it has a lock on both sides of the door. <laughs> so anyway, she fucking hides in here. It's non-practical, nonsensical fucking room. Um, in a fucking panic room for some reason in a police station. <laughs> she hides in there, and the Santa is slowly turning the handle. And of course, she's starting to get a little bit like oh, this. And then nowhere sprinklers. 
motherfucking sprinklers on here. I've written, I've written that the the guy who does the talking here he, to differentiate between the Santas here. I've called him Innocent Santa. Um, <laughs> he's not really innocent. This is Jim Epstein, the the fucking Santa Claus who has a great monologue, basically the scene before which we just marginally missed out on, and um, he starts getting sprinkler rain on him. And he's like, "Hey, what the what 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 the fuck's with the rain? Like this, <laughs> not rain, um, which I kind of love." But uh, the Santa Killer hears this and uh, breaks the handle off the door, so she can't get out the door. I don't know if that's how. Do- I might, but once I might be wrong. I don't know if that's how door handles in offices work. Eh, I suppose it kind of depends on the handle, but I would always imagine that you could just. Turn the, just turn the bar. That, that turning <laughs> button still works. If it's on both sides, it still works. What I do like is every movie I see him in, yes. well, this and Blade, uh, things rain down on him. I, I made that note. I was like, why do things always rain down on him in two movies? <laughs> they, might, they might do it in more. Who knows? A lesser known fact, Travis wrote a song. Um... It's <laughs> always raining on me. Um, there we are. That's a lie. That song came out before this, and instantly I now remember the band Travis, which I haven't thought about in like about twenty five years. Fuck. Um, Driftwood. Uh, anyway, uh, the Santa so both, Killer. Both great, like stalwart that songs. Album, to be fair. That album has, I think, every single that came from that album. I unabashedly really, really liked, whilst at the same time beginning to do metal vocals in a band for the first time and <laughs> juxtaposing <laughs> Travis with Slipknot's first album, which were out about the same time. So the cognitive only dissonance th- you need for those two things is is kind the of... The only thing I can make Travis better is a bit of a guitar, <laughs> so. Yeah, you don't know something's really sweet until you've had something not sweet before it, and then you're like, this is fucking yeah. sweet. So, yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> don't know why, there's a tangent and a half. Um, <laughs> Santa walks into the cell room. I don't, like, my, like, my short hand here is fucking awful. I put, it's supposed to be non, non-lethal Santa is now what I'm calling him. But for whatever reason, he's non-80 Santa. Don't know why it's coming out like that. Says He says, hey, you asshole, get me out of here. He uh, says, which fucking dickwad deputy are you, man? And the Santa killer lets him out, because he can't kill him if he's behind bars. And they walk into the centre of the room. And I love it, like, he's like non-lethal Santa, as I've got around here. Just trust this dude. <laughs> he's a deputy dressed in a menacing Santa Claus outfit. And he's letting me out this room. That's nice of him. <laughs> Ah, uh, this bit's just... We're going to get to the, the punches. It's just silly. Is that a thing, though? Like, if you're going to dress up as Santa and go out and commit to the Santa bit, do you yep. just, therefore, trust every other maniac that's going to do that? And just all Santas trust each other, just as, as a rule? Yeah, if you think this is a cop, he's going to be wearing his outfit, because I think it's illegal for a cop to not be wearing their outfit and... I think they have to. I think they have to either say I am a cop, or have visible identification on them for any police actions. Are you sensing entrapment? I'm yeah. thinking entrapment here. I'm thinking entrapment yeah. here. I'm, I'm already thinking about ways to get our innocent non-lethal Santa out of here. <laughs> so uh, he's uh, it's because he is wrongfully imprisoned. Like they've imprisoned mm-hmm. him because they thought he was Mr. Snow, um, and he wasn't Mr. Snow. And what he, he ran through the streets. <laughs> He's out for a jog. Um, <laughs> although he was running horribly. He was like running almost cartoon X, where you know, like, well, uh, <laughs> his high legs and high arms, um, which incense me at it and my nightstick as well. Um, <laughs> he's, as he's trying to get past, so he basically says, um, I just want to get the names right on the complaint form. He's like, deaf and dumb. Uh, and then he's, he calls him a fucking retard, which. That word is now not PC. Um, and it tries to push him out of the way. And as he's going past him, the Santa killer, and they love this in this movie, like the, the, the big epic throw, like this guy is somehow Superman. He, he kind of pushes him hard into a window which smashes in slow motion. Love a lot of slow motion. <laughs> so, uh, it was, it's Argento. Argento lighting, the glass breaks. All Argento. It yeah. would be cool if the glass broke and Stone Cold Steve Austin's music played. You know, da, 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 da. 
This movie with a five out of five. If that <laughs> Steve Austin come in, I'm fucking stunned on Santa. <laughs> Opened up a can of whoop ass. Um, so yeah, so um, we now get some awful kind of bolstering back and forth dialogue here, where um, the Santa killer actually speaks. His only dialogue in this movie says, "Not nice." <clears throat> Like he's fucking. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna use another WWE reference here. Like he's 2001 era Kane um, <laughs> with the voice box, uh, and not lethal Santa says, "Not nice." Oh, I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> um, and then he throws a punch, which is blocked by the killer. He then gets thrown onto a desk, and the Santa killer approaches him with an axe. This gets better. He presses it onto his neck so hard that he might actually remove his head just with the stem of the axe. And he might, like, our, 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 our Jim Epstein guy kicks him and manages to push him away, but then throws, like, I'm going to throw a punch, which Santa blocks. I'm going to throw a punch, which Santa blocks. I'm going to throw a punch, which Santa blocks. There's a really funny, I think I posted it once before in our chat, someone recut, like, a scene from The Matrix. I think it's the first scene where Neo becomes... He is the chosen one. Um, mm-hmm. And he fights Agent Smith in the subway and they're like throwing punches and all of a sudden he's blocking stuff and he's moving it super fast. But there's a bit where <laughs> when he throws the punch, Smith stops it and his hands a bit, well, this is a visual joke, I mean nothing to people that are listening. <laughs> stops it just before his throat and then he sticks his hand out and he goes, Ugh! like this. <laughs> and someone has edited that, fight. you can see you've never seen this before, someone has edited the whole fight scene that there's almost a point where there's a punch thrown and it jump cuts to the bit where he's going, Ugh! Less. And they were like, yeah, it fucking does it about 40 times. It's one of the funniest scenes ever, right? But this is what made me think of I'm going to throw a punch, he's going to block it. I'll just throw the same punch from the same again. arm in the same fashion. You'll not expect it. Blocks it. I'm just going to do it again. Um, and like you, You're friends with like professional fighters. Ask them if that's a technique that's ever taught. Like, if I throw something that doesn't work, should I instantly throw it again because I'll not be expecting it? That's it. They're not expecting it because they're like, there's no way this idiot's going to throw this punch for the fourth time. <laughs> Bang, surprise. <laughs> Same. <laughs> so, so, um, well, we get we get a little bit of back and forth with terrible missing punches. The Santa Killer pushes him over a desk again. Um, he lays the axe down because, like, He's not always going to, he's like, I'm going to hold this axe, but I'm not going to use this axe. Mm-hmm. And somehow, he has custom made for him a set of brass knuckles which have the words ho, ho, ho on them, which are pretty cool. They're fucking minted, right? <laughs> like, I, I'm on that. I, I, I just, I like, the only thing it was missing is one of them said ho, 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 and then the other one said, no, I've got a machine gun. Like, I mean, like, like, that's all that's missing here. Like, like Die Hard's a Christmas movie. Um, and uh, he climbs on top of him, and what I've written here is, slowly punches him to death. <laughs> Which I think is what happens. It's just a lot of, this guy's face is now mush. We cut to our hero of this movie, who throughout this entire movie has been told she's not good enough. You're not, you can't cut. You don't have what's in you to take the shot. She's now murdered a Santa in cold blood, uh, and she's ready. She shows up with a shotgun. She's packing heat, right? And uh, she comes in. Um, she finds we find Malcolm McDowell, who in the the scene before this is sh- like a flamethrower is like un, un, unfolded on his face. It looks like. It looks like it's like a, a little bit of a sc- like the Santa Killer at the end of this movie has more superficial scarring than Malcolm McDowell here. It is like someone's dropped a slice of pizza on his face and then just left it. <laughs> it's fucking it's terrible prosthetics. And I get the feeling McDowell was like, I'll be in your movie, but you can only touch this tiny little bit of my face if you want to kill me. And that's <laughs> it. And they're like, and I'm gonna speak in an English accent at times which are inappropriate. And they're like, bah! And he's like, listen, and here is my fee. Um, and if you want to see some funny things, like my, I didn't realise he was as much a prankster and a joker as he is. There, are, mm-hmm. Have you ever seen the outtakes to Halloween 2? No. YouTube it. <laughs> like, really? Malcolm McDowell is... He's, he's doing a scene with Udo Kier, where he calls Udo Kier a Nazi, is standing behind him, 
does a fake Hitler moustache and Zeke Hiles behind him in an outtake <laughs> that Rob Zombie put on the DVD. <laughs> oh, God damn it, Rob. Why, why, do you, why do you do these things? <laughs> I, I, I shit you not, it is on YouTube and I was watching it and going, this is someone's fucked with this video, haven't they? <laughs> no, no, no. And that's not the most terrific thing he does in the outtakes either, so... Um, so I'm yeah, going to watch this right after this <laughs> yeah, so that and I'll send you the Keanu Reeves thing. Uh, but yeah, so she's in there. She's got the shotgun. She's seen her dead sheriff who... I'm not dead. I'm just very badly burned. Um, she she walks like through the room. She finds the body of Jim Epstein minus a head. Uh, then Brenda, for no reason, screams. Ah! Well, right. She's like, oh, Brenda. And the killer Santa goes, grabs grabs the gun um, and gets no so the Santa killer goes to grab the gun but she gets a shot off in the room they struggle and the gun is thrown away the deputy is picked up by the neck right and she manages to struggle but manages to also get like our like extendable nightstick thing out <laughs> so as she's hitting them here to let her go she manages to say, you fucking bastard. My father was a good man. <laughs> fucking, yeah, bastard. Um, of course, the end of this movie indicates that her dad was the one that essentially went to arrest his dad, which caused him to, you know, through a you know, shot, caused him to burn to death. So I'm just going to say, he had it fucking coming. Um, <laughs> she runs over. She does a slow motion slide over the desk. Oh, this is fucking Miami Vice. <laughs> um, and she pulls out her gun and when she stands up Santa he's gone um, and out of the corner of her eye Santa comes running at her how she never saw this I don't know yeah. he's fucking huge grabs her smashes her on her wall um, and they both start to struggle and that's where your five minutes end Liam Raffery sadly sadly you did sadly. not get the reveal of our killer you did not get his death yeah. I stopped watching it at this point. I've got no idea how it ends. <laughs> I still don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's not great. I like to think Malcolm McDowell actually done this just for the gold ho 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 thing afterwards. Like he gets to take that home, and that's his payment. He went. Well, see, he did. He did those Halloween movies, and then for a short period of time, he did a lot of kind of bizarre movie choices. Like weird horror performances, like he was going to be typecast that way or something. Just purely for custom jewellery. I don't like, know about. I, 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 it's a weird like he like I think people forget he's a really 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 fucking good actor. Mm. Like his his credit role is absolutely insane, right? Um, and then you watch this and you're like, how did we end up here? Like, and he must know. He must know this is a bad movie, and I think Aye. that's why. He, I think that's why all the way through this movie he's not committing to anything. It, uh, at this point, are you just looking for... He's already cult status. Yeah. He's already... He, he's never going to be cooler than he already is. Yeah, it's pinnacle. So yeah. why not just be the the funny kind of guy that appears in these daft movies yep. and just hams it up? Because he can't I've said really it before, He's my favourite thing in Halloween too. Mm-hmm. I love him because I love the idea of this is probably in today's day and age this is probably what a Dr. Loomis would be like after surviving like the killer I'm doing the book tour I've now got an agent I want a brandy glass full of M&M's where's my Evian you know what I mean like there's there's a part of me that kind of feels like that's what that guy would become and I love his his push towards okay. that yeah it's like it's a really like, it's one of the few things i think rob zombie got right in those two movies was that element where i was like his like the loomis story arc is so much more interesting than anything else in those movies um i like the big bit with the horse <laughs> <laughs> oh there's a white horse in here and and, uh, and his wife's backing it uh. why is she backing it like, Every time I, I'm on this, we talk about Rob Zombie, and I'm I'm just, angry. I'm, I need to stop doing it, man. I'm the stop money that it. that man has taken from me. <laughs> oh, he knows. He knows. Oh. Like every, like I think he has. I think he has it, like in like single or single dollar bills that he just mm. like sometimes throws out in his bed and like rolls about going, it's Liam's money, Liam's money. Like he wakes up just laughing, thinking, I wonder if he's ever wore that t-shirt that says he's a crew member. For 31. No, I'm not. 
<laughs> Never going to wear it. I actually think I gave it to a charity shop. Let somebody else, let somebody else claim that. <laughs> Someone else is just walking around. Well, this t-shirt's really warm like that. And they're like, you made that shit movie. <laughs> Fuck you. Just, just been beaten, beaten in the street for it. Not me, man. Not me. He is like he's like I I don't know he's like a weird casting choice. And then he most recently popped up. Uh, Doug Tilly actually, um, when I was recording with him, said, "Do you know that Malcolm McDill does a sitcom in Canada, uh, based in Newfoundland, which is where um, uh, Doug's from? When they have a very, they have a different accent, right? Uh-huh. Uh, and he's like that. And we were joking about this. We were like, well, you've heard his accent here." Which is like, listen to this guy here, he's talking about this ass. And then two seconds later, he's like that. Bloody walls aren't, you know, like, <laughs> he's the, the bloody cases. You know, like, he's voiced all over the place. And Doug sent me a clip from the sitcom. And he's trying to do an Irish accent. And it is fucking awful. It is oh, absolutely really? <laughs> awful. And apparently he's a main character in it. And it's on, like, it's fourth season. I take it Canadian TV is really shit then. I think Canadian TV allows you to skate with a lot. Uh, like, right. I, think it, it, I think it really does. He was in that um, that movie with Alice Krieger uh, last year, the witch movie. Um, I forgot the name. It's set in Scotland. It's where I think I've seen that. Uh, it's like a, it, it was really about uh, Argento produced it, and it's all coming together as the circle of life. Um, Argento produced it. Alice Krieger is an actress an aging actress who is kind of forced into semi-retirement and she goes to a wellness centre in the Highlands. Right. And as she's there, um, she, I think that what is uncovered in there is that the actual grounds of this wellness centre was built on a sacrificial site for witches. Like, so where witches were burned in Scotland. Which right. never fucking happened, but we're doing right. it anyway. Um... <laughs> I mean, it's a movie. We'll just like we'll just make up shit. Um, and while she's doing that, she gets flashbacks to this very traumatic. The thing that basically stuck with her whole career is she worked with this incredible director who's played by Malcolm McDowell, um, who it's insinuated was a bit of a diddler, um, <laughs> and as a result, he's now make a, he's made a comeback and he's just had a, like a big hit and. The movie's kind of predicated on her trying to heal herself, but also at the same time, in the place she is, can she starts to reach out with powers that she didn't know she had to affect him. And McDowell is fucking shit hot in it. So is really? it. Alice Krieg is a great actress, right? But he's like the two of them. Powerhouse performances, small indie movie. And I'm like that. The dude can fucking act, which is why I know he showed up, he got a check, he was at the catering tr- truck a lot. And he didn't care about what he was doing here. And it kind of right. adds to the performance. You know what I mean? Overall. I, was he maybe contracted? Do you think that like, maybe he had one film left to do for whoever produced this and yeah. he just thought, right, fuck it, I'll just I'll do I this one? I think there's a certain part where... Do, is there not a, like a rule in... I may be totally fucking this up. Is there not a rule in America that in order to get your like insurance and SAG rates and all the rest, you have to work like a certain amount, you have to work a movie or you have to do some production like once a year or once every couple of years. We have actors that are listening to this, you can correct me on this one. Um, either that or he just, he really wanted a new car or something <laughs> along those lines. It could it could be some, look at that famous line from um, Michael Caine for the, the reasons he did Jaws 4. He basically said, I've never been to the Bahamas before. That is literally it. <laughs> never been to the Bahamas, they're shooting there. Get three okay. weeks in the Bahamas. One of the worst sequels ever made in movie history. It's fucking awful, um, and he knows that. But he just wanted to go to the Bahamas, and I can, I can kind of respect that. See, at this point, I bet he still remembers the Bahamas fondly. So, because <laughs> so, like, I'm like, just like, um, he's another guy who's got a really weird career. Like, you watch, you watch like the uh, the, the fourth Jaws movie, and your list is fucking. What the fuck? Why is Michael Caine in this movie? And then you remember in '81 he does Dress to Kill, but he, he's basically a, like a transvestite with a switchblade, and it's like a psychologist, like who's just like he absolutely Muppet, crazy. Muppets Christmas Carol, which Muppets is Muppets Christmas Carol. Like <laughs> he's the thing about him is like there's that movie Harry Brown, right? Aye, right. At no point in that movie do I think that he 
has the capability to not fall down a flight of stairs, right? Aye. Let alone murder a bunch of teenagers, <laughs> right? Which he does fucking viciously in that movie. And I, I keep watching it go like that. Charles Bronson, I can kind of get it. Michael Caine, no. <laughs> Love that movie, but no. Um, we've managed to pad this one out of 25 minutes as well. I am like Liam. It's so easy. It's so easy talking to you. Um, ladies and gents it's called tangents it's called tangents and I love a good tangent uh, ladies and gents this is uh, part of the 24 episodes we're dropping in December between the 1st and the 24th this will not be the last episode that you're hearing in this run before we take a break for Christmas there'll be another episode coming tomorrow so until then I will speak to you next time